on behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Living, and the Indian Health Service, I would like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. My name is Julie Cahoon, and I work for Kaufman & Associates. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Today's webinar is COVID-19 in Indian Country, Considerations and Resources for Long-Term Services and supports. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight the main features of your webinar interface. First is the main window where you see the PowerPoint slides. To the bottom right of the window is the Q&A pod. You can enter a question for our presenter at any time in the Q&A pod. A Q&A session will take place after the presentation. If you need technical assistance, during the webinar, please enter your tech support questions in the Q&A pod. Our tech support staff will be monitoring these questions throughout the webinar and will work to answer your tech support questions right away. You'll receive an answer in the Q&A pod. Finally, please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online in the near future on CMS.gov. Those announcements made, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Please note this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We have one presenter with us today. I'd like to introduce you to Crystal Tetrick. Crystal is the Vice President for Health Systems and Policy for Kaufman & Associates. She has over 20 years of experience working in American Indian and Alaska Native Healthcare, and it is a descendant of the Oto Missouri tribe in Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us today, Crystal. I will now turn it over to you to offer an introduction to today's topic. Thank you so much, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here today. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. My presentation will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and communities. We will review some considerations for long-term support services providers working in Indian country and for their clients. We will also discuss related tools and resources to help LPSS providers respond to the pandemic. To start off, COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus, meaning it is new to us. We haven't had prior experience with how it is transmitted, how or who it infects, who dies from it, and who is at greater risk for contracting it. We know now that COVID-19 spreads from person to person, mainly through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. Spread is more likely when people are in close contact with one another within about six feet. There's currently no vaccine to prevent the spread of COVID-19, and the best way to prevent getting sick is to avoid exposure to the virus. These data that are presented on the, the slide are from Saturday, April 18th. Um, as of yesterday in the U.S., there are 776,993 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 41,758 deaths across all 50 states. There are, um, and I'm sorry, that's 50 states and uh, four territories and the District of Columbia. American Indians and Alaska Natives are also affected by the virus. As of today, the Indian Health Service is reporting 1,781 positive cases across all 12 service units covering all 50 states. These data on your slide are from April 17th, um, but I just gave you the most current um, positive cases. Now, it's important to note that this is a very small number considering there are approximately 5.2 million American Indians and Alaska Natives in the United States. This is an ongoing problem with the collection and reporting of data for American Indians and Alaska Native population. And I want to make a few statements about data. 
The number of positive cases reported by Indian Health Service differs from the number of positive cases reported by the CDC. Although IHS reports more cases, data is reported from IHS, tribal, and urban Indian organization facilities, and tribal and urban program reporting is voluntary. But some cases may be missed in smaller tribes or urban programs that don't have the capacity to report. Some of the better data may be from local health departments or states, but at this point, it's not available to give us a national look at the impact of COVID-19 for American Indians, Alaska Natives. My point being, these numbers are understated and positive cases are probably much larger. Mortality data is not reported due to small numbers and to protect the confidentiality of tribal communities and family members. The only tribe that I know of um, reporting mortality data at this time is the Navajo Nation. And as of yesterday, they reported 48 deaths. It's also important to remember that the majority of American Indians and Alaska Natives reside in urban areas like Seattle and New York, which have been hit hard by this pandemic. Back up here. So what we do know is that tribes and urban Indian communities are at greater risk for getting sick from COVID-19 because they have a disproportionate burden of chronic illness like diabetes, asthma, and cardiovascular diseases, which are all risk factors for COVID-19. To illustrate this point, this slide is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it shows data from the 2017 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System and the National Health Interview Survey. Were American Indians and Alaskan Natives than white people reported fair or poor health status, obesity, asthma, and being told by a doctor that they had diabetes? These data, unfortunately, have not changed over the years and continue to indicate the disproportionate burden of disease that impacts American Indians and Alaskan Natives. So what does this mean in the current environment of COVID-19? Guidance from the CDC includes this list of high-risk conditions. People aged 65 years or older and living in nursing homes or long-term care facilities. All ages with underlying medical conditions, including chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, also with serious heart conditions. People at risk are also who are immune compromised, who have had um, cancer treatments, um, bone marrow or organ transplants, any kind of immune deficiencies, et cetera. People with severe obesity, people with diabetes, people with chronic kidney disease and undergoing dialysis, and people with liver disease. Again, um, American Indians, Alaska Natives can be at higher risk for COVID-19 because of these underlying medical conditions. The fact that this virus puts American Indian, Alaska Native elders at risk is a tremendous concern for Native communities. Elders are wisdom keepers and storytellers. They are teachers of tribal language, songs, and cultural traditions. Tribal communities are rightfully concerned about protecting elders and making sure they do not get sick. Tribes and tribal communities are responding proactively, mobilizing to care for their citizens, including making sure tribal members have food and per capita payments. They continue to check on their homebound citizens. They are keeping doors open for the homeless in cities, providing extensive testing in their communities and leveraging partnerships across local health jurisdictions and states. They're working closely with our congressional delegation to ensure adequate funding uh, is available for responding to COVID-19 in Indian country. We now know that the best way to avoid the illness and the spread of the virus until a vaccine can be produced is to practice social distancing. And social distancing is staying at least six feet away from others not gathering in crowds, and staying out of crowded places and avoiding mass gatherings. This model is from the University of Washington Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation Prediction Models in Seattle, Washington. It shows that with current social distancing as of last Wednesday, we reached the peak number of deaths per day, and the number will decline in the coming months. Now, it's important to note that the pink shaded area is a level of statistical uncertainty. But I find this model to be encouraging in that we have reached the worst of that pandemic in the United States. And again, with continued social distancing, there will be fewer positive cases and related mortality. 
Although social distancing is extremely important, it may make people feel socially or culturally isolated and possibly lead to loneliness, depression, and poor health. This is also an issue for people who are quarantined or isolated in nursing homes or other facilities. CDC provides guidance on how we can cope with social distancing. These points are very helpful reminders about how we can all take care of our mental and emotional health during this time. Take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, including social media, because hearing about the pandemic continuously can be upsetting. Take care of your body and mind. Take deep breaths, meditate, stretch, and exercise regularly. Try to eat healthy, well-balanced meals, get plenty of sleep, avoid alcohol and drugs, connect with others online or on the phone, and talk with people you trust about your concerns and how you are feeling. Make time to relax and do activities you enjoy that can be done while social distancing. It's important to note that SAMHSA has established a disaster distress helpline for anyone who needs help with stress or anxiety, including care providers, which I will talk more about in a few minutes. And that number is 1-800-985-5990. There are some unique considerations for helping American Indians and Alaska Natives coping with social distancing by helping them stay connected to cultural practices, because we know that culture is healing. These things include watching or participating in virtual powwows via social media, engaging in traditional crafts such as making regalia or beading, engaging in traditional medicine gatherings such as gathering sage, cedar, nettle, and practicing other ceremony. Um, smudging, drumming and singing, or prayer with others over the phone or video chat. These and other suggestions are available on the fact sheet titled Indigenous Resilience and COVID-19, which was created by the Seattle Indian Health Board's Urban Indian Health Institute. Great resource. When thinking about supporting elders in home-based and residential care, managing their stress and loneliness is paramount. This list of recommendations is available on the IHS website. They recommend to share simple facts about the COVID-19 outbreak, including symptoms, treatment, and effective strategies to reduce risk of infection in words older people can understand. Consider whether they have cognitive impairments when speaking about risk. Communicate instructions in a clear, concise, and respectful way. Display information in writing or with pictures. Engage families with information and help them practice prevention measures, such as hand washing. Contact elders via landline phones. And encourage family or friends to call their elders regularly and teach elders how to use video chat and other technology. Activities to encourage physical and cognitive stimulation are also highly recommended to support elder well-being during isolation or quarantine. These include physical exercise like yoga, chai chi, and stretching, cognitive exercises such as word search, sudoku, and crossword puzzles, relaxation exercises, reading books and magazines, reducing time spent looking for fearful images um, on TV, Reduce time listening to rumors. Search information from reliable sources, such as cdc.gov, and reduce looking for information one to two times per day rather than every hour. Again, these resources are available on the Indian Health Service website. It is also important that elders have support with their medical needs. Elders with mild cognitive impairment or early, moderate, or late stages of dementia, it's important to help them um, keep informed of what is happening within their capacity and to provide support to ease their anxiety and stress. Uh, Meet their medical and daily living needs during quarantine time. And older adults with or without COVID-19, they um, need to meet their medical and daily living needs during the outbreak. Um, essentially by providing uninterrupted access to medicines and um, making sure they have access to telemedicine and online medical services as needed. For isolated or infected older adults, be sure to present them with truthful information on risk factors and chances of recovery. And during a quarantine, adjust respite or home care services to use technology such as WeChat or WhatsApp 
to provide training and counseling for family members at home. Include psychological first aid training for family caregivers to continue their support during this difficult time. So as you are caring for your clients, here are some questions you can ask yourself and to take into consideration. How are you supporting emotional health during this time? How are you communicating information about the pandemic to your clients and their families? Can you help clients establish a buddy system so they are connected to friends and have someone to talk to? How are clients communicating with their family members? How can clients connect to nature? Even going outside and bringing a, some flowers in or a plant um, can help them feel better. How are clients engaging in spiritual practices? And what kind of cognitive and physical activities are your clients engaging in? And just as important is how caregivers and providers are taking care of themselves and being supported during this time. So some questions to ask yourself. Are you feeling compassion fatigue? And this is often a sign of trauma uh, when we find um, that our emotions are changing about how we're caring um, because we're exhausted. Do you feel you can ask for help from supervisors or friends? Do you have someone you can talk to about how you are feeling? How often are you engaging with your family and your loved ones? Do you take moments throughout the day to nourish and replenish? Does media make you feel better or worse? And are there ways you can engage in ceremony or spiritual practice? Again, the SAMHSA Disaster Distress Helpline is for caregivers and providers too. I highly recommend reaching out for any help or assistance you may need. The work you are doing right now is incredible and you need to take care of yourself. Many Americans, including American Indians and Alaska Natives, live in multi-generational families. If you are a home-based caregiver or live in a multi-generation family, the following guidance is recommended uh, from the CDC. So be sure to wash hands frequently, remind everyone in the household to avoid touching their face and cover their coughs and sneezes, regularly clean, frequently touch surfaces, Send individuals who are not at higher risk for severe illness to gather essentials for the home and wear a cloth face mask covering in public places. If you work for an outside agency providing home-based care, you want to follow your organization's guidelines for infection control. Now, if a family member is at risk for severe illness, again, make sure that they stay home and away from crowds. Make sure um, that they have access to several weeks of medication and supplies so they don't have to go out of the home. And if they do have to go out in public, keep at least six feet away from others and try to avoid places where people are sick. Now, if someone in your home is sick with COVID-19, um, these are, are some guidances. Have everyone continue to practice good hand washing methods, clean and disinfect surfaces, doorknobs, and other commonly touched surfaces with common household disinfectants on a daily basis. Again, remind everyone to avoid touching their face and to cover coughs and sneezes with the inside of their elbow or with the tissue and then throw the tissue away. As best as possible, isolate the individual with COVID-19 in a separate bedroom and bathroom away from others. Take care of the emotional health of your family, including yourself, and avoid sharing personal items like phones, dishes, bedding, or toys. If you are caring for a household member who is sick with COVID-19, in addition to regular consultation with a medical provider, you will want to do these three things. One, monitor for emergency signs like trouble breathing, continual pain or pressure in the chest, any new confusion, and bluish lips or face. Two, prevent the spread of germs by avoiding sharing personal household items and having the sick person wear a face mask if it's available. If sick individuals are unable to wear a face mask, then the individual caring for the sick person should wear a face mask when in contact with them. Have them use a separate bathroom if possible 
can avoid having any unnecessary visitors. And three, treat symptoms. Make sure the individual with COVID-19 drinks lots of fluids to stay hydrated and rest at home and use of over-the-counter medicines to help with symptoms. And it's important to remember for most people, symptoms last a few days and they get better after a week. Turning now to resources for long-term support facilities, the CMS website has a wealth of information for providers and facilities. There's information on waivers, billing, and telehealth services. I recommend administrators check the site regularly for updates. Um, for example, on Monday, two new guidances were released. The first one was new nursing home requirements for notification of confirmed COVID-19 among residents and staff. And the second one was CMS recommendations for reopening facilities to provide essential non-COVID-19 health care. Also on the CMS website is the LTSS TA Center, which many of you are familiar. The April newsletter highlighted some resources that were available from the CDC, including the most current guidance for suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases and a list of what to do to respond to the pandemic. One of the resources highlighted in the April newsletter is a COVID-19 preparedness checklist for nursing homes and other long-term care settings. If you haven't had a chance to look at this, this is a very helpful tool. It's only eight pages long and it covers um, things to think about for creating a structure for planning and decision making within your facility and how to develop a written COVID-19 plan, taking into consideration uh, facility communications, supplies and resources, um, management of ill residents, how to um, manage visitors, occupational health, and staff surge capacity. So it's a really nice, concise checklist. The CDC also has a webpage dedicated to guidance and resources for long-term care facilities and nursing homes, uh, which is shown here. Again, new and updated guidance is coming out on almost a weekly basis, so it's important to check here for updates. And I'll just take a moment to highlight the key strategies for preparing for COVID-19 in long-term care facilities and nursing homes. Keep COVID-19 from entering your facility. Identify infections early, prevent spread of COVID-19, assess supply of personal protective equipment and initiate measures to optimize it, and identify and manage severe illness. Those are the key strategies. And uh, this is the latest interim uh, additional guidance for infection prevention and control for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 in nursing homes. And uh, these changes are as follows. I'll just read through these briefly. Act now to implement all COVID-19 preparedness recommendations, even before cases are identified in the community. Address asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. Implement source control for everyone entering a healthcare facility, regardless of symptoms. This includes cloth face coverings. Um, are not considered personal protective equipment because their capability to protect healthcare personnel is unknown. Face masks, if available, should be reserved for healthcare personnel. For visitors and residents, a cloth face covering may be appropriate. If a visitor or resident arrives to the facility without a cloth face covering, a face mask may be used for source control if supplies are available. And finally, dedicate an area of the facility to care for residents with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 and consider creating a staffing plan for that specific location. In summary, the incidence and prevalence of COVID-19 among American Indians, Alaska Natives is largely unknown. American Indians, Alaska Native tribes and communities are actively responding to protect their communities there are many positive things we can all do to support American Indian and Alaska Native elders during this time of social distancing. It's important to take care of emotional health of client and caregivers. And then for resources, visit the cdc.gov for updates on guidance for how long-term care facilities can respond to the pandemic 
and visit cms.gov for updates and guidance on operations for long-term care facilities and nursing homes. So this concludes my, my presentation. Um, what we'd like to do is go ahead and do um, a poll to engage all of you and your experiences out there in serving your clients. And so we have three questions we'd like to ask you. And uh, what you will do, um, the first question is, what is the one thing your community is doing to support the emotional uh, well-being of LTS as clients? And if you could just go ahead and type your answer in the box, then we can see the answers emerging and share um, some creative ideas with each other. So I'll pause for a minute so people can start typing. I don't know if you all can see the responses. So people um, have established online support groups, making phone calls directly to patients to check on them, delivering meals to the elderly, curbside meals, delivery of medication, a lot of behavioral health options. These are great. Education awareness, phone appointments are, are done by providers. I'm just looking through here. These are great. I think they provide a lot of wonderful suggestions for everybody and snacks for the weekends, yeah. Oh, I see Zoom singing and drumming weekly. That's fantastic. Right, so I hope this um, uh, gives you some ideas about continuing to support emotional well-being and keep up the wonderful work out there, everyone. I want to go to our next poll question. Uh, one of the uh, questions we've received in the past is about respite care resources. And so I thought I would put this out to the group to find out, is respite care available in your community? So I'll pause so we can hear some answers. Yes, very little. Right, so it looks like they're through Maine Hospital only and in certain counties. So it looks like it's kind of all over the board in some places, yes. A little bit, no. And an emergency, okay. There's some resources for elders. Okay, that's great. So it's nice to know there are some resources out there. That we can work to connect people to. Great. I'm gonna move us on to our um, third question. Are there other resources you need to respond to COVID-19? Yes, more funding. Protective equipment, mm -hmm. more testing, yes. There were some pretty consistent answers there. It looks 
but there was some um, maps for elders when they got into public. Yeah. Well, this is great. And so these are some things that um, we can help communicate. Um, also with CMS, so this is great. I really appreciate your input on these questions. And um, I am going to pause now and turn it over to Julie so we can move into the uh, question and answer period. Thank you all. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, so now we will go ahead and move into our question and answer or question and answers or comments um, phase of the presentation. So if you have a question for Crystal, please type your question into the Q&A pod located at the bottom right side of your screen. And once we have questions rolling in, I'll go ahead and ask those of Crystal and she'll give a verbal response. Okay, and our first question is, uh, Crystal, how can physicians help with telemedicine services for the provision of care for both COVID and non-COVID care through IHS? That's a great question. And I think um, to get support from that is contacting your IHS area office um, to get more guidance around that. Next question is, are there any official CMS tracking of these issues for tribal communities or anything from the National Indian Health Board? Yes, well, I know that the National Indian Health Board has been hosting uh, regular conference calls um, with uh, CMS and um, the CDC and other federal agencies. So they are working nicely in partnership to address these issues in Indian country. Um, so those webinars are being posted on the National Indian Health Board's website, and you can also sign up for their um, newsletters where they also announce uh, those uh, conference calls and webinars. Okay, thank you for that. The next question is, who might be a good contact about how to work with IHS to provide astronomy support and supplies? Um, let us look into that and um, we can um, get that information out to you all. I, I think that's really important that we have a specific contact that you can connect with on these questions. So let's, let us get back to you on that one. Okay. All right. And as we wait for questions to stream in, again, if you have a question or comment even, um, please type that into the Q&A pod located at the bottom right side of your screen. So another question that has come in is, some assisted living facilities are blocked from ordering face masks from their normal supplier by CDC and other suppliers have non-medical face masks or MERC has expired medical face masks. What is the best of these two bad options? Can you re repeat the last part of that again of using expired medical face masks? Yes, the question seems to indicate that there are limited ways to get um, 
medical face masks? And is there a recommendation on right. how best to secure that? Um, well, I think the, the most important thing is, is that uh, you're consulting with your facility administrators and um, the guidance that they're giving you. Uh, what I understand is that, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that cloth-based masks, we, we don't know the effectiveness of them for healthcare personnel and that healthcare personnel really should be using the N95 masks. Um, with respect to whether they can be reused at this time, I don't have an answer for you. I'm, I'm not a, a medical expert, a physician by any means. So I would, again, consult with your administrative team and um, continue to follow the guidelines that are issued by the CDC to wear um, um, PPE. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you on that. Are there any other questions, Julie? Okay, we are waiting for additional questions to come through. Okay. It appears no other questions are coming through, so we can go ahead and move towards um, Closing the, the presentation. So, Crystal, I want to just see if there's any additional um, comments that you would like to share as we wrap up. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for your, all your um, incredible work that you're you're doing um, to um, support clients and across Indian country. And um, I just I, I'm just so grateful for all the work that you're doing. I hope this information was helpful. There's a lot of great guidance out there. And um, we, um, I just am so appreciative to be with you all today. So thank you and have, have a wonderful rest of your week. Okay, great. Thank you, Crystal. And so in closing, I'd just like to remind everyone that there were a few questions that we would like to uh, secure additional information about, and then we will follow up with everyone who has registered and participated in this webinar with an e-blast that will provide that additional information. And that will also include information about government agencies that are hosting uh, weekly calls um, that will support your efforts. So again, I'd like to thank Crystal for joining us today and sharing information about COVID-19 resources to support long-term care and support communities in Indian country. In closing, I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and that the audio and presentation slides will be made available online at cms.gov on the Tribal LTSS Technical Assistance Center website. Thank you again for joining today's webinar. Our session is now concluded.